appreciate uh, give a big thanks out to SoCal Bio for uh, inviting me to be here tonight with all of you, and thank you all for showing up. And uh, hopefully, uh, my goal is uh, simple: just to um, hopefully everybody will walk out of here with maybe something that you didn't already know um, about 3D printing. You guys did a fantastic job to kind of cover the overview of 3D printing and. I'm going to focus a little bit more on like the medical side of what uh, we do um, at Dinsmore. Um, and before I begin, I'm going to go ahead and pass out uh, some parts that while I do the presentation that you guys can kind of look at. Um, these are shoulder uh, scapulas from an actual patient that was taken from MRI or CT data that we actually get that data. We can convert it to a model in which we can actually print the patient's anatomy. And these models were actually used for a specific uh, surgery um, that was done here at Ho uh, Hogue Orthopedic Institute. Okay, so is that fine? My name is Jay Dinsmore. I'm the president and CEO of a local service provider um, that specializes in 3D printing. Um, I've been working in this space for 23 years, um, for a long time, I guess. The term 3D printing did not, uh, uh, that term didn't exist. With me, it's a love-hate relationship because when I got into this business, it was called rapid prototyping. And now we've evolved into 3D printing. I get uh, uh, phone calls probably about one every couple of weeks from a family member, a friend, somebody that you know is excited that I know that says, Jay, I gotta buy one of these 3D printers. I gotta have this thing in my home. I'm gonna be making toys and widgets and I might be able to make food with this thing. This is awesome. And so it's kind of interesting how our uh, industry has evolved from what it was to what it is today. But it's very, very exciting because of what you can do with the technology now. And hopefully um, I'll share some of that with you guys in my presentation here. So um, what's possible with additive manufacturing? Um, that's another term that you can use. Uh, 3D printing, additive manufacturing direct digital manufacturing, it's, it's really kind of all over the place. Uh, you can, I think somebody told me today that you can buy a printer, a 3D printer, a Blu-ray 3D printer for $175. So um, from there to you can buy a very expensive metal 3D printer which makes titanium parts, um, parts that you can put in aircrafts and plantables into the human body and those would run on the larger size uh, machines upwards of $2 million. So we're at $100 or $175 to $2 million and that's now what's called a 3D printer. So try and figure out how to explain the t different technologies to people and get them to understand what you can do with these things. And everybody's gonna have one in their home in the next five or 10 years, which um, I, I maybe, so. Um, can I, can I get just a show of hands real quick of how many people have heard the term rapid prototyping? All right, nice. And how about 3D printing? Obviously everybody's gonna raise their hand, right? Um, so one of the things that you can do um, in the medical device world with, uh, with rapid prototyping, 3D printing, additive manufacturing is you can significantly reduce your time to market um, utilizing these technologies as you heard in the previous presentation with Aaron. Um, we're turning parts around, literally a majority of our business now is within 24 to 48 hours for our clients, that's what they demand. So we get CAD data in today, today's Thursday. We'll be delivering clients parts tomorrow, for sure, without a doubt. So that's how fast, when I back up 20 years ago, if I delivered a part in two weeks to a customer, they were absolutely blown away and that's now been shortened down to they expect the parts to be in, you know, delivered in 24 hours. Um, so that obviously time to market in product development is very, very important. Um, it, it's, I mean, arguably one of the most important things, especially in the technology age that we live in today. You never hear the product development cycle shrinking or getting shorter or, oh, you have another three months or six months, that just doesn't really happen. It's all about when is this project gonna be done and when are we gonna launch this thing? So. Um, the, uh, the different technologies that we use, I'll get into in the next slide. Um, the, one of the really cool things about what we get to do is working in the medical device field because we get an opportunity to work on 
projects that are going to uh, help to save people's lives, to work on new technology development um, with our friends at Edwards. And thank you, Mike, for showing up on such late notice. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, I'm going to do. He was six weeks old when we were at a restaurant for dinner one night when he stopped breathing and turned blue on us. He spent 10 days in the hospital then, came home. Um, two days later, he ended up getting, turning blue again, stopped breathing on us, and prayed every night, just hoping that he would pull through. Quite a few of the doctors said that he had a good chance of not leaving the hospital alive. It was the most devastating thing that a parent could ever hear. At that point, I think we were both desperate. Anything that would work to make him live, it, we pretty much would take it and run with it. No other doctor knew how to do anything about it, so luckily Dr. Green came up and was able to do something. Tracheomalacia is collapse of the windpipe that makes it so a child is unable to breathe out. It's fairly rare, about 1 in 2,200 children has tracheomalacia. Kaiba is one of those children that had severe tracheomalacia. Even with the, the best medical treatments for it that are available, he continued to have breathing difficulties and continued to have events where he was unable to breathe. We obtained imaging of his defect with the CT scan. Scott Hollister instantly and rapidly went about designing a splint that could go and meet this, this need. This is the first time this procedure has been done anywhere in the world. This is a model of Kaiba's trachea and bronchi. The splint is designed to slip over the top of the bronchus just like this. This is really the first time I think it's been used uh, on an emergency basis where there was no other treatment available. So we get the plastic, the biopolymer, in a powder form with very small particle size. We also have a, f a computer file uh, that contains the information we've designed into the device, essentially the geometry of the device, et cetera. It's a, it's a biopolymer, essentially a, a plastic that's biocompatible and you can use it in the body and it, it resorbs over time. Kaiba was brought to the operating room. The splint was placed over the top of the bronchus. This has a process of opening the bronchus up anteriorly and posteriorly to completely widen the bronchus. It was amazing. As soon as the splint was put in, the lungs started going up and down for the first time. We knew that he would be okay. It means, it means the world to me just knowing that something actually worked and was able to save our son's life it just means everything to me yeah, but when he gets older he, he can tell the people the story it's all it's going to be is a story about his life how he made it how he's doing and how far he's going to go We did not do anything on that project, but I was kind of throwing something together last minute here. I was out of town last week in Jacksonville at our user group meeting, and I just found this video, and I thought it was so telling to, to put in there. Um, a lot of people don't realize that we have materials now that are implantable into the human body that are 3D printed materials. So there's a ton of different, and there's going to be more things that are going to be coming and more material development, and that's where the big push in our industry is. Um, these are some of the processes that I'm sure some of you uh, already are familiar with. Um, SLA, sterile lithography, 3D systems, goes back to the mid 80s, uh, that technology. Still actually the most widely used 3D printing um, technology out there. You have SLS, selective laser sintering. Um, that's actually the way, that material for um, baby care, but the, that was an SLS process with a material called PEAK. Um, you have FDM, uh, fu fused deposition modeling, which is a lot of the um, extrusion-based technology that you see today that's coming out in the marketplace, the $200, the $500, the $1,000 printer. These are all uh, basically extrusion-based technology, which is FDM. You have polyjet, which is a jetting technology. Um, you have direct metal laser sintering. 
And uh, those are probably the five most widely used and most common that people know. And then, of course, you have 4D printing, which I'm going to show a little video clip on that here in a few minutes. Um, touch on a couple of the materials that we use on the SLA side, um, Watershed, BioClear, and Protogen. Um, those, I don't know if those names mean anything to any of you guys. Um, we use them every single day, so they're just kind of ingrained in our head. But they've passed the ISO 10993 biocompatibility. They're also USP class six, which is kind of cool. Um, the, uh, we have clients like our friends at Edwards that utilize these materials for their product development cycles. Um, we'll get into that uh, in a few minutes. What are some of the things that medical device companies are doing with the 3D printed parts that we manufacture or that they may manufacture themselves? Um, using parts for 510K device development, um, animal studies, biocompatibility, um, cadaver studies, obviously form, fit, and function testing to make sure that the design is sound before you go spend um, a lot of money in tooling, as Aaron pointed out. Um, bench testing, um, assembly protocols and studies, um, these are all uses for these uh, for the 3D printed parts in the medical device uh, product development cycle. Uh, a couple of things uh, as far as case studies go. Uh, unfortunately, there's not there's a lot of cool projects that we have that we're working on that I can't talk about. But there's a few here that I wanted to talk about. Uh, one is the uh, Hogue Orthopedic Institute. Um, the the parts that I'm passing around. I'll show you a little video clip in a minute on that. Um, also, I was at our user group uh, last week. We have it once a year. It's all about additive manufacturing and 3D printing. And there was one cool thing that I put on here, um, a company called Vivacore. It's the Texas Heart Institute. And I tried to get the video clip from Dr. Cohn, but he couldn't get it to me in time. He uh, presented there. And they have a 3D metal printed heart. It's a three piece. Uh, titanium piece that goes implantable into the body. They have 20 or 30 cows that have these implanted. And the video that he showed was, um, I, I don't know, some people call it smoke and mirrors, whatever you want to say, but I saw the, uh, cows on treadmills the next day after they implanted this device into the, into the cow, which is pretty, uh, pretty amazing. So. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a video clip. I'll show you a picture of the device in the next slide. Um, different medical models, as I mentioned already, cranial implants, uh, drill guides and fixtures, um, pre and post surgical models. That's a huge market. Um, does everybody know the company Invisalign? Do you guys know that company? So they were the largest single purchaser of 3D Systems SLA equipment. A lot of people don't know this, but when you go in for a case for Invisalign and they scan your your, your, your teeth and they lay out your, your plan. Every single model that they make is a 3D printed model and then they pull a form off of that to make the trays that actually go into your mouth to straighten your teeth. And they, they started doing that about 10 years ago, but you just don't really know because they kept it obviously very hush hush. But I wanted to bring that up too because I figured everybody would know who that company is. So 3D printing to straighten your teeth, pretty cool. Um, here's a picture of the Bivacore artificial heart. Um, that's basically what the device looks like. And again, it's a 3D metal printed titanium artificial heart that will go into, well, they're testing on cows now, but um, pretty neat stuff. And when you saw, I wish I had the video to show you guys, but unfortunately I don't. Imagine if your surgeon could practice on your body before your actual surgery. For the first time in a story you will only see right here, a doctor at Hogue Orthopedic Institute in Orange County is using 3D printing. Our Dr. Bruce is here right now to explain how it really is changing medicine. Dr. Bruce. Well, Colleen, this will surprise most people. Take a look at this. This is actually a form of a shoulder made from a 3D printer. Dinsmore 3D printing in Costa Mesa. It turned a CAT scan into this plastic replica of the bone in just hours. And by looking at this and studying it, the surgeon was better able to prepare and do more precise surgery. It was done on this local woman. Juanita Heath has been suffering with severe shoulder pain for years. It's awful. I mean, you can't brush your hair. You can't wash your back. It's, um, 
it's, it's awful. It's painful 24-7. Tests revealed the pain was coming from a combination of arthritis and a surprising hole in a bone. We need to bone graft before we consider doing your shoulder replacement. Orthopedist Russell Petrie said the first step would have to be to figure out a way to repair the hole, which was in a difficult to reach and see location. How do I fix this hole so that I can fix her arthritis problem without creating a problem? The solution, an innovation Petrie is pioneering, using 3D printing to create an exact model of Juanita's injured shoulder. He could then use that print as a guide for Juanita's surgery. We actually did a formal operation on the model before we actually did it on her. And when the doctor performed the actual surgery, he knew exactly how to fix the problems because he'd already done it with the model. It was the most incredible sense of deja vu because I've already been there but yet I've never actually been there. And that may make operations safer for some patients and more precise. The doctor is now using 3D models for other challenging cases. With the hole fixed, Juanita will soon get the new shoulder she wanted. He said he couldn't have done the shoulder without using that 3D method. Now, some experts say this study, this approach needs more study. Others say 3D printing could change the way we practice and operate. The technology is now fast enough and cheap enough for individual doctors to afford and maybe signs that insurance companies may soon cover the extra cost. Chuck. And the insurance companies are actually starting to recognize this, which is also um, very cool in my opinion, because now uh, <laughs> it's really funny. Do Dr. Petrie actually did my ACL reconstructive surgery back in 2002, and this we did this last year, and I didn't know that he was the one that actually, that we were doing these models for, because we were doing them directly for Hogue, and he comes to my office, and I'm like, I know this man. <laughs> it was funny, small world, but... Um, if I were to go back, I had some complications from my knee surgery, and I wish that that I could have been able to, you know, have something like this done, and the insurance companies recognize that to have a pre and post surgical model done with surgery like this. So I'm really excited about where it's going to take us in the future. So um, one of the things that uh, Ahmed wanted me to talk to you guys tonight about was 4D printing. And I would be lying to you if I told you I was an expert in 4D printing because 4D printing is fairly uh, complex. Um, it, it's, how do I put this? So imagine you're designing a model in 3D CAD and you have predetermined when you're designing this part that at some point in the future you want this part to do something or move or change its shape and turn into something else. And that's basically what 4D printing is. So this part, this slide, this was another slide deck that I had that doesn't work, but I have another, um, I have another present or a two or three minute video clip. If you guys would like for me to show you that, I can show that to you um, about how 4D printing works. It's worth it. Mm -hmm. Some assembly required may soon be replaced with just add water. d printers i never get tired of thinking about all the possible applications like building a brand new coffee table or building a brand new 3d printer or finally getting that strickland action figure everyone's been asking for but all of these great products have one thing in common rigidity that means they're going to keep that shape once i print them unless i take a flamethrower to them or maybe a hacksaw but the advent of something called 4D printing could turn all of that on its head. That's right, it's 1D better. Actually, it's not just a catchphrase. 4D printing is really about using a 3D printer to print out self-reconfiguring, programmable material. Now imagine this, you have a non-living object that can change its shape and behavior over time. It's kind of like a robot, but there are no microprocessors, no circuit boards, no motors. In fact, to you, it looks like a string of plastic, but you toss it into a kiddie pool, and upon contact with water, you now have a secret message spelled out in plastic cursive. Skylar Tibbetts, the man who really came up with this idea of 4D printing, has gone even further. He's created 
programmable sheet material. It's a sheet of plastic that, when submerged in water, can clench up into the shape of a cube. And a cube is just the beginning. More complex designs will mean millions of more shapes, like self-folding origami. In the near future, imagine a smart grid of plumbing with pipes that can actually expand and contract in response to water demand, or maybe even heal if there's a frozen segment that breaks open. Or imagine self-assembling furniture. Print out a flat board and just add water, next thing you know it curls up into a rocking chair. Now, wrap your mind around how useful this would be in a really hostile environment like low Earth orbit, where building stuff comes at a high cost and high risk. Now, the prototypes we have seen so far have been pretty simple, but the promises are amazing. Think about it on the really big scale. What about skyscrapers and bridges? If we could make them out of smart materials like smart beams and smart bricks, they could heal themselves after weather damage or prepare for something massive like an earthquake. Or we flip it. We go on to the very small scale, and now we have microparticles moving around in our bodies maintaining our health. You might be wondering how much complexity can build up out of stuff that just changes its shape without computers or electromechanical motors. Let's think about proteins for a second. Proteins are pretty much what make any basic animal function possible on a cellular level. And a protein is really self-reconfiguring material. It's a polypeptide. It's a long chain of amino acids. So once again, we're playing copycat to Mother Nature. Now, let's not get ahead of ourselves. I'm not actually suggesting that we're going to be printing out some sort of plastic replicant that can gain self-awareness and yearn for more life. But maybe we will. In fact, it's hard for us to predict right now. We're just seeing the very beginning of this technology and the complexity could become truly amazing. So, how would you use 4D printing? Let us know. Leave a comment below. We promise we're going to read every single one of them. And uh, hey, while you're there, why don't you like the video if you enjoyed it and subscribe. We've got some great stuff coming up soon. Um, so why is 3D printing or 4D printing um, important to the medical device industry? Um, again, just to go back, uh, the faster we can get innovative medical devices into the market, um, the faster we can save lives and help cure people of disease. I think that's huge. Obviously, time to market is big and uh, reducing the product development um, cycle and the development cost by eliminating steps or expensive tooling is definitely a big part of that. So um, I would like to thank uh, Mike for joining me um, tonight. I asked him, I think, two days ago, and uh, he does not have a formal presentation. So what we're going to do is I'm going to have him come up here and give you guys some real um, as to how the R&D team at Edwards uses 3D printing in their development cycle. And um, we can pass some parts around, for, some more parts around for you guys to look at. And uh, then afterwards, we'll um, try and answer whatever questions that we can. Mike. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Michael Pop um, from Edwards Life Sciences. We're just down the street here. Um, actually, we, we donate quite a bit of money here. We have, a, uh, I think, a small facility um, from Edwards uh, that uh, we operate here. We send a lot of our, uh, actually, uh, employees here for furthering education and everything. Um, <clears throat> I've been at Edwards for about 13 years now. Uh, we are the leader in heart valve uh, therapy and sales in, I think, I believe the world. Um, we have been working with uh, Jay for, you know, even before I was there. We've been, for a long time. Yeah, a long, I don't even know how many years. Um, we kind of reconnected probably about seven, eight years ago, and um, uh, it was it was an interesting time because um, it uh, a lot of the um, a lot of the managers and a lot of the uh, project uh, leaders didn't really understand the the 3D prototyping and stuff, and this is all kind of new, and we kind of leveraged it, and so usually when they tell you, okay, you have uh, a timeline of this to get this project out into market. They usually creep that back by a couple months, and then they say, now try it, you know, because they want to challenge you. Um, so luckily, with the 3D prototyping, 
there's a lot less guessing that goes on. You know, you, you do the CAD model, which is which is incredible. The 3D modeling, you can pretty much see. You want to model everything, very similar to um, the printed circuit board you guys were talking about. Even though it adds no value, you can never use that piece, but you use it for assembly and you understand how things go together, how things fit, tolerancing, all that good stuff. Um, that can end up getting you later on. You you spend uh, twenty thousand dollars per tool, and you have you know twenty different parts. It's a lot of money to invest and a lot of time. Sixteen weeks of waiting for this these parts to come. They finally come, and then you realize, oops, we made a mistake. Guess what? We got another sixteen weeks for waiting for one tool because something was wrong. So, um, luckily with the three D prototyping, we can kind of take just about one hundred percent of the guesswork out, and we just go from there. So we we're able to bring that timeline in a lot closer. Unfortunately, now the project leaders are understanding the technology and they're creeping that back even more and more. So <laughs> we're having to deal with that now. So we're waiting for Jay to come out with the new technology. It's going to make it even faster. So um, uh, anyways, um, uh, no, I'm just going to talk to him for a minute. Um, so, so I'm an R&D engineer. Um, and a lot of times, you know, people think of, um, you know, speed to market and stuff like this. Um, we have um, products that we develop, and a lot of times we start at the design phase, or uh, I'm sorry, the uh, brainstorming phase, and we come up with ideas and crazy things, and we build things really big and make sure they work, and then we kind of miniaturize them, and then we end up uh, going a little bit farther, and, um, you know, a lot of times we'll start with either foam or clay or, you know, something just something to give us an idea and whittle something or make something from another project, another piece or something. Uh, and then we finally get down to where we're actually using them in CAD and 3D modeling them. And then we have, um, we send them off to a 3D prototyper. And a lot of times with Dinsmore, um, thank God this guy saved my uh, career quite a few times. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's been literally Saturday afternoon ca calling them on the phone saying, I'm sending my model now, can I have it Monday morning? Um, so luckily they're, they're able to uh, meet our demands and it's, it's, it's that kind of turnaround and it's that kind of partnership with Dinsmore that's kind of made us um, uh, meet our goals and, and be successful at what we're doing. Um, our, our sales just continues to grow. Uh, we're actually a spinoff from Baxter, the heart valve therapy group we spun off. Um, but anyway, back to the um, product development. And it's not just 3D prototyping in the early stage and then we convert over to um, injection molded parts. But um, it, it is kind of, you know, we 3D prototype these, we test them out, we, we probably do, um, we, we end up building one or two of them at first with Jay, and then we go back and we'll build maybe 20 of them. And then we'll see if they work over, you know, in different atmospheres or different water environments or something like that. And then we go off and we finally have them molded and guess what, they look exactly the same. You know, they're, they're perfect. And they're, right, they're made of the right material. So. Um, We've gone as far as to actually uh, 3D prototype all the separate parts and create a motorized handle. This is nice because now I can put this in marketing's hand and marketing picks it up and goes, oh, you know what, I don't like that. And uh, we don't start redoing our tooling. We end up going back, we re readjust the CAD model, give them what they want. Maybe it's, maybe it's this, they don't want it coming out the side, they want it coming out the back, easy fix. We can pop a hole in the back, cover this one up, send it off to Jay, get it done. He ends up painting it, making it look real pretty. Marketing's happy, everybody's happy at the end of the day. But that's not where the 3D prototype stops. It, it continues on, even though our product is moving forward and we're going off and getting it uh, injection molded and machined or doing whatever we're doing. We're also taking uh, very, very similar to what everybody's been talking about today is CT scans. Take CT scans of real patients and we end up making tooling fixtures. Or this was a test environment right here where we actually mount this to another piece and we have this flow go through here. And on side, on side of the heart right here, up in, up in the uh, top atrium, you have this appendage and blood kind of circulates in there. And everybody knows if blood sits for too long, it starts to coagulate and it becomes a blood clot. And then the blood clot will go up and then it becomes stroke and then we have problems like that. But for some reason, on everybody, most people here, we have this weird appendage that sits here. And uh, the question is, you know, does blood pool up in there? How long does it take to get out of there? So we rigged this little test up and uh, we're looking for a product. We, we hooked up the pipes here and we just dropped in some food coloring as we washed water through here. And we timed how long it took for the, the food coloring to come out. And 
our quality engineers will come back and say, well, how do you know that's representative of the market? And we'll, we'll say, well, this is, a, this is actual a model of an actual patient. So it's hard to argue that stuff. Um, you know, other than that, how, would we, how do we understand how big this area is or, or how we can get this stuff? So um, it's been huge, huge help. Um, other things is um, when we develop the product, we actually go out for the first time. If you guys can imagine having an idea, putting it down on paper, brainstorming, how do we make it, how do we manufacture it, and then finally get out there and you're gonna go into a patient. That is a terrifying thing because you know, you, you happen, I've actually had the privilege of starting at the brainstorming all the way up to where I'm walking past the patient's family that are waiting in the waiting room and we're prepping the device. You know, this is the first patient this has ever been in and um, you know, we, we do all of our little stuff here, but um, it's, it's just, it, your heart's going, you're sweating, you're, you know, all this stuff. But what makes you feel more comfortable is that we've printed out a patient one day before, because a lot of times these are compassionate cases. We don't have a lot of prep time. They do the CT scan, they send it to us that day from maybe Germany. So they email it to us, we get the data, we take some measurements, we create a 3D model, we send it to Jay, and the next morning we get our model. We can now look at the appendages on the inside of the heart and we can see where we can anchor our device. Everybody is different inside here. So we can see if this patient is good or not. We can take certain measurements at first, but it's always nice to get this part. And then we can actually put it inside um, a bath and we can do actually practice on it. Just very similar to what Jay just showed. Um, you print these things out, you actually get to try out your device on that patient before you even get on the airplane to fly over there and use it on them. So it's, it's just, so it's not just developing the product, it's all the way down to using the product and it's just been a huge factor and, and you forget, I mean, we've been using this so much that it's, it's you start to forget and it's just, you know, taking advantage of how much the 3D printing, that's why when we, when we had this, uh, when I got asked to be, come here, I was like, who doesn't use 3D printing? You know, it's <laughs> it's a part of your life. I mean, how could you live without it now? Um, so it, it's had a huge impact on, on Edwards, I know that. Um, we also use it in the tooling environment, in manufacturing. We build tooling, and just as fast as marketing changes their mind, so does our product. And so we don't have to re-go out and wait for two weeks for somebody to machine some tooling. We send it over to Jay with the modifications. He, he makes a new one, we get it back in 24 hours, and we're still going. So uh, management's happy, marketing's happy, everybody's happy. So it's just been a huge impact on, on manufacturing and, and speed to market. So um, one other thing, I, I shared a story with a couple people outside. Um, this, this goes along the lines of, we need to start really thinking about what we wanna do with this. With this 4D printing, it's kinda like, um, okay, how? What, you know, how, I, I can't even think about how to use that. Um, our minds start going, we start using, thinking, okay, is that possible, is it not possible? The simple thing of me sending Jay an email and him getting the part and making it and delivering it back to me is great. Now, if you think about what happened, uh, I read an article, I think it was on LinkedIn, was um, the space shuttle, or actually, the space shuttle or the- um, Space station. Space station, yes. They have a 3D printer up there and they need a tool. NASA sends them an email. They print out the tool. They have the tool. And it's done within a day. So it's just amazing that all these things we need to think about and need to just expand on. It's, it's you know, there, there's no end. The, the only limitation is their own mind. So anyway, thank you very much. Thank you.